Today is December 22, Ukraine Media Center, Ukraine Forum continues its operation. My name is Vasil Samakvalov, and we start our panel discussion with the topic Ukrainian Information Front, Lessons, Conclusions, Victories. We will be talking to the representatives of the expert community, representatives of the government, of the profession, on the lessons Ukraine learned during its war, including the information war. Our guests today are Taras Shevchenko, Deputy Minister of Culture and Information Policy of Ukraine, Maxim Mayorov, expert at Center for Strategic Communication and Information Security, Diana Dudzik, founder and executive director at Ukrainian Media and Communication Institute, NGO, and Marina Vorotintseva, senior analyst at the Center for Countering Disinformation under the National Security and Defense Council, and Alex Quero, spokesperson for Reporters Without Borders in Ukraine, whom we will ask about how Reporters Without Borders help Ukraine abroad. <clears throat> I think that we will start with Mr. Taras. And maybe our, my first question will be, what are the main conclusions for both personal and as a representative of the, of the organization you work with. What are your conclusions within the last uh, 10 months of the war? We have two mics here. Please take one. What's the regulation here? <laughs> well, it's a purposeful regimen we're having here. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I've got a small presentation, so I don't know whether it's better to start with it right now or... Well, yeah, let's start with it because it, it can create some framework for our discussion. All right, yeah, it's right there on the screen. The clicker is right there. Excellent. I would like to briefly switch between the sheets. It's a panel discussion and not the report of the ministries. So in brief, I would like to cover the key areas. The ministry was working in year 2022 with our conclusions, our evaluation of every topic. So first of all, I want to uh, remind you about the TV marathon that emerged in the end of February. However, the test drive was on the day of unity on the 16th of February. So I think that it's it will be redundant to present marathon. There are many pluses, but there are cr critical things about that. And it's an important component of a joint television space of the television news in Ukraine, and it was uh, created based on the memorandum of, of the signed between the companies. If we take the key channels, they are being retained on the marathon, and the rest of the channels can uh, make money on advertising, creating other type of content. My personal expectations are that the marathon will remain actual during the wartime and during the martial law. Channel freedom, the same. I would say that in the beginning, I, uh, the expert community was taking it skeptically, but we see less skepsis now. Five 0.1 billion views of the content of content in on social media almost 60% are the views from Russian Federation the TV channel presenting news in Russian language for Russian speaking viewers all over the world that the brand recognized in many countries throughout the world currently and in my humble opinion is the, the, the best that our government created for foreign language broadcasting, we, we have a low base for comparison because previously Russian speaking language uh, channels were weak in my opinion and in their background freedom works better and uh, I'm not ashamed of it. The Center for Communication and Information Security I think the colleagues will tell about that the center was created by the ministry within uh, one, one year before the full-scale invasion. It's very good that we had uh, some preparation works. We had a platform to work with the messages, with the channels, 
with international community, with the civil organizations. It, for us, it's a bridge of cooperation with the civil organizations which work countering, in countering disinformation. The school of countering disinformation, what we do in cooperation with our partners at cost of Swedish embassy, the Center for Democracy and the Rule of Law, they develop and implement the programs of education, integration of the programs for qual uh, qualification of the experts. Ukraine Forum continued its operation, the agency that even before was existing, but they reinforced their work in all fields, the work of uh, journalist points, but the, the main change in operation of Ukraine Forum was the creation of this center we're currently sitting in, in the beginning of March on the platform of Ukraine Forums, the ministry initiated the, the cre creation of it on the platform of Ukraine Forum, no matter what happens, so that the Ukraine Media Center becomes a platform for journalists, including foreign journalists. We talked to our colleagues with Ukraine Media Center and we launched, launched this initiative in the most effective and rapid manner. That's the example of good cooperation between government and civil organizations. The help, uh, the support of journalists, the protection of rights of the journalists, so protection of their rights, including the cooperation with reporters, filter, national project of media literacy. Media literacy is the uh, important aspect in countering disinformation. Filter became one of the main priorities which we started working on from year 2020 and we launched it in year 21 and since the beginning of 22 they are actively involved in countering disinformation. So government information policy is what we're doing at home and abroad and what we will continue doing because there will be need for it next year. Uh, the breakdown by Ukraine, we have a list of those who were added to the sanction packages in the same way that the, there is a uh, example of strana.ua, sanctioned policy of uh, uh, European Union, the sanctioned packages that were added into 6th, 7th and ninth package. Uh, we contributed a, a lot to, to that. Uh, as, as a national council, we contribute to the implementation of sanctions against Russian TV channels after the renewal, after the deoccupation of the towns and villages in Kharkiv region, in Kherson region, uh, specifically this central picture in the Hrivnia newspaper uh, in coordination with our ministry, the new issue of Hrivnia was disseminated and now it's been carried around the deoccupied territories of Kherson region in the right bank of Dnipro. The accessibility trainings with the record numbers of uh, participants, more than 1,000 participants so within two trainings, the law on media, which is a part of URA integration legislation, which uh, covers implementation of the audiovisual directive. Our task for the next year is implementation of the directive, more regulations to be adopted at the level of the parliament and cabinet of ministers. But in the beginning of this year, it was less realistic to be approved, but it's not only approved, but it's supported by everybody, by all the fractions of the parliament, almost 300 votes. Information campaigns, we had a lot of them, the day of unity, that was celebrated this year only with, with the development of identity, uh, placing the identity of social advertising in all the advertising platforms, the safety of, of uh, the traffic and other campaigns on the slides. So those are the elements of what the ministry is doing. And if we make one summarizing Conclusion, it's that the most success is in the area of close cooperation and teamwork when government works together with the businesses, with the civil society, 
when it when different government agencies cooperate between each other in media sphere and it's not only ministers because there are many government agencies and organizations in my opinion that in situation when the country is in full scale war this cooperation is um, mostly efficient and productive starting ag again with the center we're currently sitting in and continuing with a lot of other areas i will stop right there so maybe you can pass the microphone to your colleague who will may tell more about the activity of the center is the, st the center of strategic communication and information security and one of the tasks of the center is the fight with the fight with the disinformation and appealing to the presentation to uh, I would like to ask well, well, what are the most efficient tools in countering disinformation? What are the tools that are more appropriate in countering disinformation? Thank you. I want to thank Taras. He t told about the general framework of operation of our center. Uh, if I may, I would like to start with uh, more theoretical questions and then proceed to the practical ones which cover the work of our Center for Strategic Communications. Well, in the subject of countering disinformation, Russian disinformation, there is there are three main things to remember about why this why this fight is unsuccessful or even not necessary. First thing is that the countering disinformation or fi fighting the myth reminds the dance with the skeleton. When fighting some phenomena, you're, you draw attention to this phenomena, you support it in a way. Like you support the skeleton you're dancing with, you don't let it fall and uh, fall apart. And the same way that with the myth, if we ignore the myth, they disappear by themselves. But uh, if you pay attention to them, you kind of support them. The second thing is that fighting Russian disinformation is is vain because the scale of Russian disinformation the f information flows and their potential they're so intense that uh, you ukraine doesn't have anything to uh, to counter this flow of russian disinformation and the third thing is uh, that the course about uh, for talking truth always and uh, trying to fight disinformation with the truth is not always a win winning strategy because of uh, manipulation and lies uh, usually they are ac accepted better by the audience and they seem a better tools for information warfare than uh, honesty and truth so those are the three things which can be frequently heard during the discussions when we're talking about strategic communication and countering disinformation and to whatever is related to this topic and we have to recognize that all these three things i told you that they are they're true to a certain extent because everybody who, who deals with the russian narratives they understand that in in part they are true but, but the universal principles of what we have to do with russian disinformation so these three uh, formulas the, the, they are not the key principles to rely on they have to be accounted in certain situation but every situation should be considered on a case-by-case -case basis and we have to prepare the reaction to this or that challenge with account of all the small nuances but the general approach to countering disinformation for us specifically is the truth because the truth is not weak it's not uh, losing it's not something you cannot win with because because it creates trust when you're not being being caught on lies it creates trust it creates equal communication and this faithful approach that 
trustful approach, the respectful approach to your audience is the winning strategy for Ukraine, no matter all the disinformation, there are nuances with information psychological operations Ukraine and undertakes as well, but I'm happy it's not my institution who conducts those operations, it's the competence of the special structures uh, who are connected with the armed forces or special services. It's uh, not something that Ukrainian journalists do or government agencies do in uh, the in, in information policy field. In uh, Russia, the, the, there is no difference between combat propaganda or uh, journalism, and journalists work uh, as a propaganda and disinformation agents. So I'm happy we don't have it. This is as to the efficiency of the approaches to countering disinformation. Uh, concerning the work of our center, as I mentioned, Taras uh, gave you the overall picture, but what can I add, how we communicate, what we do, we can divide it into three main components. First component is the uh, delivery of information about the main news, about the government position regarding certain events or phenomena and the cr uh, spreading and broadcasting of useful information which is necessary for the citizens of Ukraine during war, or, for example, how to act, act during shelling, how to protect your gadgets, and so on and so forth. And the third component is the debunking of myth, uh, the c countering disinformation, debunking of fakes, something that we've been talking about. The task of our center is more like to pack those messages and to deliver them to the audience. So who's your audience? We have a broad audience both inside the country and abroad. We have English-speaking resources, Twitter and different other platforms. We evaluate our audience, so the control of uh, who our audience is, is our priority, like whom we work actually with. We're not uh, monopolists in this sphere, like Taras mentioned, and we have colleagues from the Center of Counter and Disinformation with whom our tasks overlap to a certain extent. And I think that together with our colleagues, together with the civil society and other actors, we have a useful synergy that allows us, uh, what, uh, not, not allows us, but allows the state in general to, to be efficient. But what's the measure of efficiency of your work? Well, we can base this evaluation on quantity and quality indicators I apologize, but one criteria is, for example, if we talk about the quantity criteria, if we take about the coverage, the audience, about the social media, so those are the measurable indicators, how many uh, subscribers we have, how many readers we have, It's be, the information is being gathered and analyzed, and let's also mention the quality indicators. We have to convince our we can, audience that we, we are faithful, that we are true. If we see our messages be, be, being retweeted, reposted, if we see the interest to Ukraine, to this war, if it's not uh, fading, it means that we reach our goal, we achieve our goal. So let's wrap up with the expert uh, opinion and Let's proceed to Marina. She represents the Center of Counter and Disinformation at National Defense and Security Council, and she knows all the issues in Luganshina and the success of Russians back in 2014 was based on the fact that their propaganda was efficient because Europe and the whole world they in fact they ate the they swallowed the annexation of Crimea and parts of the Donetsk and Lugansk region. So if we compare to the year 2014 with this active phase of war, what changed? Good afternoon. Thank you for your question. You switched me to my experience. I did grow up in Lugansk, and I worked in the media from 2003. So the Un uh, unveiling of this uh, propaganda story which uh, preclude 
was coming before the annexation of Donbass and Crimea. It's an interesting experience. And then after 2014, I documented how Russian propaganda uses the same methods trying to involve other people from other regions into their information bubble. Some, somewhere they did succeed, somewhere they did not. But the more I study this subject, the more I see that all our attempts to debunk some fakes or to discuss, uh, enter into discussions with propaganda machine because they cannot be effective because it's not dozens of, of people who work against us. Because it's the automated software which works against us, which d disseminates the messages and creates them and provokes us. So the most part of our work is not public, but what's public is uh, debunking of Russian fakes. We have a specific software developed, tailored for us, which documents not only the quantity, but also the quality of uh, broadcasting of, of what Russia does in the media. But we also document what Ukraine does on the media front. And I have good news for you, Ukrainian, the quality of Ukrainian response and countering disinformation grew significantly within the last year. And sometimes we even played draw with the Russian information machine. It's very good news uh, in view of the uh, f scale of funding for uh, allocated for Russian information warfare. And we have bots who can uh, who can communicate with the uh, live humans and up to the fifth comment you cannot detect that you're actually talking with a robot so our the par large part of our work is technical we have a t technical analytics we document the scale of what russia does against russia and uh, and what russia does against Ukraine in Ukrainian information space, Russian information space, and abroad. So we accumulate our capabilities in other languages. Five years ago, we were mostly specialized in English. Now we develop our capacities in other languages as well. There are different elements of this machine that we're seeing, the fakes, manipulations, and so on, it's different technical instruments. They are just a part of a one big strategy. And the main goal of ours is to realize and to counter it on a systematic level. Because the, the debunking campaigns, yes, I agree that if we try to debunk a myth, we enter into a discussion and it's some incessant process. But when we realize that we don't this, we are not in a discussion with a, a live human, but with a robot, it's uh, the main task is to imitate the discussion about the political situation in Ukraine. So it's their main goal that we don't uh, really discuss it in a real information field. It's not like a real discussion, but I am discussing something with a non-existent human who completely imitates the live human. And in this way, it completely distorts the information situation. It distorts the social process. And that is the goal of Russian disinformation and propaganda. In 2014, we did it uh, in Lugansk and uh, Donetsk region through Kontakte, through Russian TV channels. They switched off the Ukrainian topic and they created their world of non-existent reality. And through the significant efforts, they were taken through investment in their technical capabilities, the closing down of the channels. Well, you remember uh, all the accusations of suppression of the freedom of speech when we closed those TV channels. Imagine the, those TV channels were working back in the to beginning of the year on 24th of February, what would they show and whom would they show? So proceeding to the methods, the policies is such that if they use te technical tools against us, I, I call it technical terrorism, because what's happening during the last 20 years, it's only for what I remember when I started documenting it. So we cannot consider it fakes or manipulations. It's the complete distortion of the social discussion of the information field. So the significant part of our work is the technical part blocking, removal, and so on and so forth. We uh, draw a very 
specific line because f between freedom of speech and information terrorism, we know who's the useful idiot or who works for Russia for money or who can support. I'm talking mostly in, about the Western world. There are people there who support certain issues, but those who broadcast Russian narratives are uh, either paid people or the, the, those who are being paid, be, they're being reinforced by the technical means of uh, disseminating the narratives and Russian interests. So we don't deny the right of Ukrainians to discuss what's going on in Ukraine, but if you're a bot or if you're a, somebody who is paid by structures financed by Russian Federation. So we deny any accusation about the pressure of the, of the free, on freedom of speech because it has nothing to do with freedom of speech. So, and ag again, about the law on media, when it was voted, we documented a very large information campaign about the law on media, uh, about the imposition of military censure in, in Ukraine. It was very interesting to observe it, how the Russian propaganda broadcast and uh, where they pick their messages, whom do they re repeat. And usually they just do copy paste of the Ukrainian opposition leaders or opposition actors, and they just spread spread them on, in their media. And we see how the efficiency grows and so the, the campaigns that were going on uh, uh, during the voting for the law on responsibility on liability of the military servicemen so they work with any of our examples so no matter how we counter their disinformation they will have their war against us so our task is the uh, understanding of the technical infrastructure and the countering on countering it on the infrastructure level and not debunking of any specific facts or fa or i would rather say fakes I would like to give a word to Diana, but you passed it mostly to Alex. Look, the reporters without borders were engaged in blocking uh, Russian TV channels on the, the satellite. So I would like to ask in what way information war in Ukraine will influence the information policy of Europe? What will be the lessons for the European media community to learn and where is the border between the freedom of speech and information terrorism did the europeans learn to divide those two notions okay so there's a lot, a lot of question to answer in uh, in one uh, let's first focus on indeed the hotel sat story because i think it's a fundamental story it's a crucial story that was also held by the minister of, uh, of culture uh, the idea is is you talked about technicality and blocking the bots and the idea of, of blocking the bots. Uh, the idea is to quite literally switch off um, well, Russian propaganda at its very source, which is this French satellite network, Atelsat, uh, that allows us now to completely block access um, Russian propaganda, so Russia in three, three, three TV channels, uh, to 15 million Russian households. It represents 25% of the Russian market. So it's a, it's a really heavy blow against Russian propaganda. And um, RSF took this position because it was absolutely unacceptable for a country like France and for also for an organization like RSF, which is, you know, build on freedom of speech and, of course, the defense of the press uh, to continue allow such, uh, such propaganda to be spread through a French network. So uh, this is an ongoing process. It, the final, final, final decisions should take place this week, but it, it will go, uh, I believe, uh, it, will, it will be fine. Um, now I want to uh, <laughs> well, you know. uh, also focus, because we, we sort of spoke about this information a lot, um, and I would like also to focus about the job of RSF here, because you cannot counter disinformation with propaganda, or you cannot counter disinformation with another kind of disinformation. You can only counter it with uh, real, journalis real journalism doing a real work on the ground. And that's why also one of the aim of RSF was to protect was to, uh, journalists here on the ground. So far we protected roughly t uh, 300 journalists by giving them equipment, etc., etc., on the ground and allowing them to report 
on the truth of what's happening in Ukraine. We're talking 32 nationalities here. So any, any kind of effort that the Russian propaganda can do, they will not be able to counter a journalist that you know, from Brazil, from England, from anywhere that goes on the, on the field and comes back and say, well, I saw that from my own eyes. And that's also part of, of what we do here. That plus some grants with helping, uh, um, helping small medias here. And it does create some ecosystem that allows uh, to fight disinformation. Now, the problem, you, you talked about what's happening in Europe with disinformation. There is indeed it's a, long, it's a long fight because there is indeed a vacuum of knowledge about how nefarious uh, some TV channels are. RT still broadcasts in some, in some countries in France. Uh, in, uh, in France or in some countries in, in, in Europe. Yeah. RT is quite uh, influential in certain countries, even in South America, for example. So. Uh, the, the fight is against disinformation through those channels is far from over, of course, but for that it's also on the Western side to understand that sort of by themselves, that this is propaganda. Russian propaganda is not journalism. There is no two sides. And we hear a lot this, this speech of, uh, well, you know, and if, even if we read some, you know, some Western media, well, that's what happened in Ukraine, but in the same time the Kremlin said that. You cannot take the words of the Kremlin like that and basically equalize both words. This is not how it works. This is not how journalism works. So um, I think my main point is to, through all these initiatives, protecting journalism on the ground, uh, the Atelsat initiative, uh, giving grants to, uh, if I'm not wrong, yeah, 30, 30 Ukrainian media and uh, 94 Ukrainian journalists, and also, and that's also an important point, uh, we also work into the legal point of view, which is holding Russia accountable for its crimes against journalists. Uh, we published uh, um, an investigation about the killing of Max Levin and Oleksiy Chernyshov. Uh, we are publishing soon uh, um, a story about uh, a close associate of Prigozhin and basically uh, his, his wrongdoing against journalists. This legal side is important because right now Ukrainian law is also building and being part of a system where Russia has to be held accountable for its war crimes, including crimes against journalists, which are indeed war crimes. So that's basically what we do to fight it. Thank you for your job. So let's uh, proceed to Diana as the representative of Ukrainian journalism. She's more like a civil actor now, but we know that there are no former journalists, so the question is as follows. How can a Ukrainian journalist not turn into a propaganda actor? How to keep yourself in this triad because between a civilian journalist and a propagandist? Is the real journalism, objective journalism, is it possible in the country which is in war? It's a complicated and simple question at the same time. I will say that maybe our journalists work this way, but the question is, how do we understand the standards? How do we understand the profession today? And the challenges we're facing now, and in this sense, it's one of the things I wanted to talk about, one of the subjects. I think that we don't always have an understanding on part of our Western colleagues, colleagues. And this is how the discussions emerge. I'm just back from Bratislava, from uh, international conference, we had a discussion with a German journalist. So I, I'm talking about the uh, fact when the Western journalists uh, talk about the standard balance, there is a sterile understanding of this balance standard under peaceful conditions. So do they want us to give uh, everybody a Russian point of view? So you know, when Western journalists and the, the, they put on this scale the word of the Wagner mercenary and on the other scale the word of Ukrainian servicemen. So, and we understand that in one case is the representative of the aggressor country and on 
other state is the representative of a victim country who defends their homeland. So can we use the equal criteria of evaluation for these two parties? I have a big question and after that conference I had a report there I was talking that we probably have to start a discussion in the international media level of about what should we do with that it's a challenge for all the media community not only for Ukraine and I appreciate my colleague who says about the uh, liability for Russian propagandists it's very important to mention it, the world journalist community should uh, say goodbye to these handshakes with uh, Russian journalists, those who uh, consciously or maybe unconsciously propagate the Russian information discourse. It requires very serious and profound discussion and it cannot be ignored. And I think that after this war, it's not only Ukrainian journalism, but the world journalism should should transform from inside uh, to rethink certain values and phenomena and the attitude to them because this is our common future that depends on that is the uh, future of freedom and democracy no matter how how loud it may sound and i appreciate the fact that there are colleagues who understand it it's very pleasant because it's very difficult when there are some the hot discussions and we hear from the Western journalists who say you're all traumatized and it's difficult to discuss everything, anything with you. You, uh, you react emotionally, you're under stress, so we're not going to talk about it with you. But it's a bad story, in fact, and we want this conversation, we want that discussion. So I think that our colleagues from the Reporters Without Borders will propose such discussions and it will be very useful and good for all the media community, in, I mean, even the world community who sees this world under democratic angle. But I would also like to react, if I may, from my expert vantage point, because it's also something that uh, concerns me and which I think is important. I think that when we talk, uh, I was talking about that since 2004. When we talk about countering disinformation, I mean Russian disinformation, somehow we get down to the only media plane. In fact, this this issue requires requires us to go out of the media plane. I will give you a simple example. Back in 2016-17, I was in the east, in the in the front line in Donetsk and Luhansk region, along the front line. I was going around the schools, and what I've seen there, I've seen the school libraries with the Soviet era books, and it's a catastrophe because even if today we come to the occupied territories and we offer Ukrainian content, we let uh, Ukrainian radio there, we issue the Ukrainian newspapers there, it's not enough because there are Soviet books in the school libraries and Ukrainian editors uh, already r brought up this issue, they said that we have to take uh, this issue seriously I mean, in those libraries, they're totally filled with Soviet books. There are Lenin books in the shelves. They have Ukrainian literature as well, but uh, it was issued back in the Soviet era with uh, Soviet introductions uh, in, uh, in uh, style of Russian propaganda. So how can you teach the kids to love Ukraine and treat Ukraine positively by reading those books? So we have to understand that Russian propaganda, which is count, uh, coming there, it sows the seeds in the fruitful soil because those Soviet patterns that are retained by the elder population, they are being overlapped by this uh, not very good edu educational process. 
and uh, some people don't want to talk about that but i like that i like it that this issue is being brought up in the information field the issue of information influence of moscow charge moscow patriarchy charge the influence on the religious communities that russia exercised here in ukraine why i'm talking about this because it's not only about eastern ukraine we come to the western ukraine i'm from ternopil myself and what i see in kremenesk and pochayev lavra and the uh, influence of moscow patriarchate is very powerful there and w what i'm seeing in ternopil region i'm hearing russian narratives uh, among the population and it doesn't come from tv marathon or local newspapers it comes from the priests of the moscow patriarchate and this is where we have to look for the ways for the some non-standard solutions that uh, we probably used before when we closed down the russian channels maybe we have to look some non-standard ways to shut down the russian charge as well but maybe even if we come to the full restriction of the moscow patriarchate charge it doesn't necessarily mean that the adherence of that charge will become pro-ukrainian immediately that they will immediately get rid of those russian narratives and the question is how to work with those people, how to, how to work with the people in the deoccupied territories, with those who were under influence of total propaganda, even, even within the last half a year. I'm not talking about previous years, starting from 2014. So this is the question of the matter, not only of one marathon or one newspaper, I would offer, and we were always talking about that in our reports when we an analyze the results of the work in that area, in that field, there should be a complex approach. Everybody does a lot. And uh, within these years, I can tell you that Ukraine can teach experts of the Western countries in many things, and I don't exaggerate. But the question is, we don't have some unified, some standard system. Everybody works, everybody does a lot 24-7, but in their own specific field, in their own specific area. But if we join the forces, if we join our efforts, if we create this synergy, it would provide better results. And to summarize, I want to say a few words about the media market because it's very important for the future in the context of TV marathon and the critic we're hearing uh, also on part of the expert community i think that tv marathon should exist as long as the martial law is in effect and i hope that the majority of the representatives including uh, representatives of the government taras voiced this uh, government position that it should be going on during the martial law but it's a horrific challenge. I, I would use even this word. The media market faces a horrific challenge but because the market does not exist. The economy is down and we have a question. How shall we recreate the Ukrainian TV channels from these ashes? We understand that they will not be broadcasting in the format that they did before 24th of February. What's going to happen to them? What's going to happen to these big holdings that were existing before? We can be happy about the, the fact that these holdings will not be so oligarchic but I'm uh, concerned by the fact what's going to replace them. I don't see sufficient sources of funding which would allow those media to get back on their feet. So there are two sources, either government or international funds. Both ways are not very good because the government, if the state gives money, it uh, has a lot of risks and the international funds, they cannot give money on the uh, the constant basis they give they can provide funding for some projects so now that the war is not yet offer, over and uh, we have to start the discussion of how our information space should be what 
what will be with Ukrainian media after the TV marathon, even in the content context of uh, newly adopted uh, law on media, there will be a lot of questions in regional media, in media communities, and so on and so forth. So now it's time when we face a lot of discussions and a lot of challenges. If anybody has any questions, please let us know. Meanwhile, if I may ask everybody uh, in a view what Diana said, that Ukrainian experts uh, have something to teach the Western experts, because in Ukraine, in fact, we opened the Pandora box when we understood that information and disinformation is not the only media, that there are uh, books which may bring harm. We cannot, uh, we cannot draw a straight edge between the freedom of confession and the harm posed by the church. But what are the lessons and the conclusions that the world can draw from our war? What, what will change in the world? Well, let me start, if I may. Look, in principle, we are seeing how the world is changing already in terms of uh, approaches in contests of protection of the freedom of speech, how they treat the blocking of Russian TV channels, and the fact that Ukraine was talking about it before the full-scale invasion and during the first days of invasion. It, it looks less appropriate for, for Europe. The first uh, resolution was on Russia today and the satellites. Then uh, it changed their perception. And now blocking of TV channel is uh, uh, happening in a lot more facilitated manner. So is the change of the way of thinking. Uh, there is understanding that you cannot treat the propaganda resources originating from aggressor country using the same standards for freedom of speech. Countering disinformation cannot be limited with debunking of fakes or spreading of your own narratives. You just have to eradicate the channels. So if I may detalize, so the freedom of speech ceases to become an absolute in Western democracies. It means that freedom of speech Speech is not so widespread in the country which acts as a terrorist. If terrorists capture an installation, there were discussions in the journalist community. Can they be given voice or should, do, are we playing along with them? Now it moved to a government level, to the state level, that there is a conclusion that blocking of TV channels that they use to reinforce the war to incite the hostility, there is such understanding already. I think that the c conclusion will be is conviction of the propagandists in a process similar to Nuremberg process, in the same way that it was happening under the World War II, this mass process will I influence the history, the, the development of the media of appropriate restrictions for media. Is there anything to add? Just a couple of words to add. I think it's difficult to say, maybe the representatives of the world should say how do they change, but I think that we should be coming to some point like not restriction of the operation. I don't think that the banning of uh, Russian inf information TV channels is a uh, restriction of the freedom of speech, but we have to rethink the notion of the freedom of speech, of, of its substance, because the people who lie, they cannot be on the same scale with those who tell the truth. You just, uh, okay, but, but who is to define who is who's lying and who's not? So this is the matter of discussion. It's important to voice it. Thank you. Just another couple of words about how things change. The changes will be very prolonged. It's obvious, for, if it's obvious for us in the countries of Europe, it's not obvious for them. For example, the Stratcom conference of NATO in Riga, I report on our experience of work with the social media and I have to, and I get two questions. 
they uh, refer to some study that uh, say that 60 percent of Ukrainians think that Belarusians are enemies. And uh, uh, the question is why, and if I'm not surprised by that figure, and why do I use the word propaganda uh, in a negative way? I thought it's, it's a joke, but that was not a joke. It was a serious question. Why are we afraid of Belarusians, and why do we use uh, the word propaganda in a negative sense? Well, the people in uniform, they use propaganda in different ways. Yeah, but I haven't seen good Russian propaganda. Well, they, they could, there could be a propaganda about the helpful way of life or giving up smoking. And uh, I had to explain uh, what was happening around Kiev and the role of Be Belarus in those processes. And with all due respect to all the professions, some specialists have a low level of understanding of information context. So I have to say that those changes, they will take a long time. And it's a mistake on our, uh, on our part to think that we reached everything, we achieved everything, because there will be a recoil and they will be fighting it. Or oh, just let me respond about the... Uh, absolute of the freedom of speech, who can be given freedom of speech or who cannot. I think that the machine algorithms cannot be given freedom of speech. It's something that we could not uh, forecast when the principle of freedom of speech was uh, a nascent notion, because among the uh, free individuals, uh, the life and freedom are the absolute value in our world. In in fact, there is such a Skynet emerging, the world of Terminator. We are on the verge of this world. Well, maybe not in terms of killing machines, but in, on the level of propaganda, it works quite extensively now. And what Ukraine can teach the world or what the world can learn from Ukraine, unfortunately, rather than fortunately, I would say I'm a citizen of this country, but it turns out to be so that this war and our country became a huge polygon for everything, polygon for modern arms, for modern weapons. No one could test the Western weapons before under conditions like this. The, I mean, the weapons that we're using now with this enemy, such enemy as Russia, and it's a polygon for understanding of what freedom of speech is and how to counter propaganda. It's a polygon for uh, activities of the international institutions, the efficiency of their system of support of international law based on the uh, rules of the international community, United Nations. So it, we're a training field with crash tests, with a lot of things, not only in information field. So I think that even when the war will be over, I hope it will happen sooner than later, the world will have to rethink a lot of things based on the experience of this war. Maybe it may be comparable in the scale to what happened after 1945. We have questions in the studio. Oh, 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 my apologies. Two, two, two quick words. Um, I think I appreciate the word polygon, but is there, there is this idea of training and the idea of training of, of learning something, right? Of, of going through something. And, and this war is already shaping well, what's happening in Europe is already shaping the world order. Uh, I just want to do a, a quick, really, really quick, I have two words about our partners, the European Union, Taipei Foundation, Open Society at LSF, and also IMI and other organizations in here. Why Taipei Foundation? Because it's Taiwan. Because also what's happening in Ukraine when it comes to freedom of speech, when it comes to what's going to happen in the media, and may happen, may happen also in Taiwan versus China. And that's also, these are the lessons that will be learned when it comes to defending freedom of speech in Ukraine will also have to be applied when another aggressor country comes and try to aggress a smaller country. And I think that those lessons have to be learned here in Ukraine. Yeah, Chris Hampson, National Security Media. Uh, of your questioning about your comment about teaching people in the West, um, I think it's important to line out what Ukrainians face for narratives. In the West, the predominant three narratives, if I had to summarize them from the West, were there's a Nazi problem, 
uh, it's us versus NATO, uh, watch your budget. There are certain uh, you know, ways that they can hit the American audience that cause them to dissuade being interested. But I tell the Americans, but wait a minute, you have to understand what the Ukrainians are facing. So if you could give me maybe the top three narratives that Ukrainians uh, are faced with in disinformation, especially in 2022. In microphone. Sorry. Sorry, I forget about the, the mic. Um, so personally, I live in Ukraine for six years, but I, but I, I am not Ukrainian, so I cannot speak uh, on behalf of Ukrainians. So I'd better have someone actually Ukrainian speaking about that. But what I can see as a journalist, because I'm also a journalist on the side, well, I mean, the narrative is, is fairly simple, really. It's just that, that's, you know, the, and it's not even a narrative. It's basically what happens. Second invasion of Ukraine, uh, it's basically what's happening in Ukraine today is a genocide, purely, purely and simply. There's a methodic, systemic uh, uh, system of torture designed to kill Ukrainians by Russians. That's, that's the basic truth. And every time, you know, uh, Russians or Ukrainians liberate, liberate a territory, well, I mean, we discover the atrocities by Russian. That's what's happening today. We also, I mean, from what I also know as a journalist, and again, then I will leave the words to, to someone Ukrainian, rather, it's like, well, Ukraine doesn't want to invade Russia. And despite, you know, seeing Russians doing, creating defense, the defensive line in Belgorod, they can do that. I mean, it's just lost, wasted money, really, because Ukraine won't go there. Like Crimea, okay, but like the rest, and, and Donetsk and Luhansk, but Ukraine will not invade Russia. We will only take its territories. Now I will leave some Ukrainian. <laughs> it's difficult to answer this question because for us all those things are obvious. The, the, the people who are present here Everybody has their expert uh, opinion. They know the details. They know how to counter the narratives. But talking about the society as it is, I would say that we, we were discussing this problem. We, we cannot quite say that we've overcome the Russian propaganda in the heads of our people, in the heads of our society. The problem is still here. And it means that there is a lot of work to be done in this regard. But generally, people, I don't know, this narrative about the Nazi ideology is so inadequate that debunking it is, uh, I don't see any sense in debunking it each and every time because everybody who is here in Ukraine, they know that we're not Nazis, we're not fascists, we don't eat little children, we don't drink their blood, we don't do that. We're just defending our homeland. I'm trying to clarify the question is because to the American audience, and I do radio every Monday about disinformation, um, I tell them that the reason why the Nazi argument is aimed at the American or Western audience is to prevent them from wanting to, to, to help Ukraine. So the, it's not really a concern about Nazism, it's an effort to dissuade effort. But there's a difference uh, in what is aimed at Ukrainians, which is about who you are, what you stand for, what you're fighting for. So that's, that's what I'm aiming for. What is it that Ukrainians, for instance, with the Step Maria uh, effort where volunteers can come in and report channels. What are, if I were to, to isolate certain narratives that are aimed at them every day in 2022, are there some of those, like for instance, you're losing or you're taking losses or you're really, uh, you're really Russian, that's one I know I've seen in the past. So that's what I'm aiming for. What are the things that I could tell Americans, the Ukrainians experience that the West just never really sees? Well, you know, t touching this issue the, of I identity, are Russians equal to U Ukrainians? There are many stories about the self-identity. If we talk about the Russian times, the information space was uh, homogenous and Russian propaganda media, it was 
holding the whole society in the same discourse and looking for differences between Ukrainians and Russians was more difficult for outer spectator and there was little motivation on part of uh, 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 arguments how could we differ Ukrainians from Russians why Ukrainians are not Russians that's on a general level and it, it was a big mistake by Russian propaganda they, they haven't seen this 30 years that we're living without the Soviet Union and moreover they haven't seen these eight years we've been living in the conditions of their aggression so very frequently building their communication strategies they treat us as if we're having the same common space with them and very frequently it can be seen heard from the words of those who come back from being prisoners of war uh, how they were being tried to to be processed so to say they were uh, appealing to, to some cultural layer which is uh, which those people just don't know about I'm talking about the young warriors they were talking about the same artists the same cartoons so that those uh, those who interrogated them, they, they, they were not uh, able to find some common ground with them because all this Soviet uh, culture layer, all that experience that there was uh, before year 91 or even year 2014 is completely destroyed. So now is the question of identity, the question of self-identity even after what started after the 24th of February there was a real revolution and for Ukrainians it's not a question of what's what differs Ukrainians from Russians and it's easier for Ukrainians to communicate it even to Western audience if such questions still arise it uh, may uh, create some dissonance within Ukrainians why these questions even appear we understand that this revolution of conscience did not uh, did not happen at the same time in the West when it happened in, in Ukraine. To talking broadly, I, I mean in broad masses, the people, for example, who don't communicate with Ukrainians usually, but even a short conversation with a Ukrainian is enough to understand that this difference it does exist and it it is cardinal. But yes, I agree that the disclosure of the contest of uh, what's going on in Ukraine is still a, a big challenge. But uh, if we're uh, talking, if we are Russians, so if we start talking that Great Britain and the United States are the same country, maybe they have some common history and they speak the same language, but it's not so well so the same story is here with ukraine and, and russia and our languages are different your question hi uh, my name is hunter williams and i'm with inkstick media uh, i was just wondering uh miss diana this question is directed first foremost at you but also the entire panel uh if you'd like to jump in and speak on this as well i'd love to hear your insight on this i'm curious if you could expand and talk more on the role that the russian patriarch and ukrainian church is linked to uh moscow have had in spreading misinformation and disinformation in Ukraine and the efforts to combat that uh, misinformation. Thank you. Well, just a couple of words. It's not quite the subject to our discussion today, but it's of uh, quite tan tangential because we're uh, talking about communication here the church has its own system of communication no matter what church it is is it Greek catholics or moscow patriarchate but moscow patriarchate is very e efficient in application of this communication strategy to their adherence and what was documented even in videos well you, you can find it online when when the priests, they directly during their services 
or their appeals, their addresses to the adherents, and they push Russian narratives in, in those addresses. They glorify Russian patriarch Kirill, and there were even cases where when when the people were praying for the health of the military who kill Ukrainians in Ukraine, for the health of the Russian military. So it's absurd. They have their system of media. We have to remember about that too. And this question was not brought up anywhere else. So I think we have to tip off our security service of Ukraine, the media issued by the Moscow Patriarchate, they have printed media, they have a website, or, well, at, at least they used to have uh, printed media before, I don't know about now, how it happens during the war, so we have to check out what's going on with uh, that media, because it's another channel of communication, and we have to sort out what to do with it. Anything to add? Uh, Steve Kleinman, Pacific Rex. Uh, you touched on this a little bit in the panel, but I'm wondering, wondering if you could address uh, the effectiveness of Ukrainian state agency strategic communications to the United States. And specifically, uh, the standard instrument of strategic communications in the US is distributing press releases through companies like PR Newswire, Business Wire. But Media Center and United 24 and other Ukrainian state agencies don't use these services. So when I speak to colleagues, uh, they don't have an awareness of a lot of key information down from President Zelensky that state agencies seem like they, they tweet about it, they put it on Telegram, they post on Facebook, but it never comes out on a press release. Uh, why is that? <laughs> the, the question is to the government agencies. Well, the question was maybe to the office of president, uh, where well, nobody is entitled to give comments on behalf of the office of president. If you think that it's the uh, per communication through press releases is more efficient. We uh, appreciate your evaluation. We will pass it on to our colleagues. I'm not a strategic communicator myself. I'm a lawyer by education. Well, maybe the way of delivery of information through telegram channels and th through other short messages through social media is more efficient and rapid. It gets not only to the audience, not only to the media community who consume, consumes the press release, but it's being distributed to both journalists who can repost the information and the people who sign up, who subscribe directly to these communication channels. But again, I'm a lawyer. I'm not an expert in communication. But at the same time, we will review your comment. Thank you for this question. As I already said, there was a, re a revolution in Ukraine, and Ukraine is a training ground for trying some new forms uh, and shapes, including shapes of communication. Our organization is called the Center of Strategic Communications and Information Security, but it does not necessarily mean that we act within the framework of some traditions of strategic communications existing in the United States of America like you mentioned. We don't work exclusively with the social media. We have a dissemination. We do the documents on a daily basis on information positioning, which are being sent out to the state media. We have different forms of communication and delivery of information. Why do we emphasize, make emphasis on the social media? Because it's been almost quarter of the 21st century, so we, we're trying to master the most up-to-date instruments, most demanded instruments, uh, and which uh, deliver the information to the consumer in the most efficient and rapid manner. And we don't, for example, 
take into account that the regular citizens are our consumers, but uh, when we, we talk about the communication with di different go government agencies, so you don't have to underestimate the social media and dismiss it, thinking that it's something with a low status if it's a verified account which communicates some uh, true information in a normal professional way, it's a good means of communication. I see no problems about that. If we find more ways of communication, we will get armed with them and we will not neglect the traditional means of communication. Diana? Just a couple of words because the, there, there's a very important question about the sources of information used by Western media. Uh, I observed certain transformation in, in this field because uh, when it started in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea and first military operations in Donbass, we made a coverage of uh, English-speaking media and German-speaking media in our organization. And what we wit witnessed is the information sources they were using, they were using the Russian information agencies. And as a rule, the events in Ukraine were covered by the journalists of uh, Western media who were based in Moscow. And it was a very serious problem. And I think that within these years, especially after the beginning of the full-scale invasion of after 24th of February, this situation changed, uh, but it's still not ideal for us. We see the Western, that Western media, they started opening offices in uh, Kyiv, and there is a large number of Western colleagues who work in Kyiv and throughout Ukraine in general, and this is a very important moment. I've heard very important question now. I understand that it's a task for our media organizations to find out the needs of the Western colleagues what could be useful for them, what could be a good quality source of information for them. Could Ukraine, Ukrainian independent media become a useful source of information for them? Could they trust them? What should, what should this source of information be like so that CNN, BBC or Frankfurter Allgemeine refer to them? What's missing? Is it the English version that's missing? Or I don't think that is the only question, but because the Russian media were quoted before, uh, they had no English speaking English language version, but it was not an issue. So I want to find out what are your needs. Maybe you can tell us about them now, and maybe it will create the new story in communication with the Western world, between Ukrainian media and Western world, not only with the state, because the state and the government, they build their channels of communication and they can do it in a number of ways, because communicating with different types of audience uh, may be exercised in different ways. So if we talk about journalists, what kind of sources do you need to trust them? What do we have to do so you trust us and you refer to us and not someone else? We can go use the way of Russians and Tas, who became a partner to Reuters, to he have reference in Reuters directly to Russian correspondents. If there is anything to add, we can add because uh, time is running out and we should wrap up. So then take it as accusation, but there is a problem when we we uh, have our movements unsynchronized with the Western journalists, Western correspondents. On one hand, we have a situation when some information from Ukraine is coming with a big leg, maybe through language barriers or maybe some other severe criteria of verification, the use of pictures, images, for example. There is such problem on one hand, but on the other hand, there is a problem when the information goes a little, a few steps ahead, even no matter the restrictions by the government, like there are many accusations that the Western media post the pictures of destructions inflicted, resulted from the strikes of Russian 
missiles and drones before Ukraine uh, disseminates or the Ukrainian government posts their own position in this regard. So they ask not to post some graphic information which can serve the enemy to verify the damage or correct their their future at attacks to understand the weak links in air defense forces, for example. But it happens frequently so that those rules are applied to Ukrainian journalists, but not to the Western reporters who appear on the sites and they make those pictures which are being disseminated all around the world. So this problem of asynchronicity is another problem. Well, we're not discussing it now, but it may become an issue to, to discuss in other platform, not like just unveiling some information, but just coming to the same page, the same platform and uh, applying the same rules. Okay, so next time we will talk about the joint context standards and instruments. I would like to remind you that we had Taras Shevchenko with us, the Deputy Minister of Culture and Information Policy, Maxim Mayorov, the expert for the Center for Strategic Communication and Information, Diana Dusik, founder and executive director at Ukrainian Media and Communication Institute, NGO, Marina Vorotintseva, senior analyst at the Center for Countering Disinformation under the National Security and Defense Council, and Alex Quera, spokesperson for Reporters Without Borders in Ukraine. Thank you and see you tomorrow.